And uh, I began to tell people in my, to my little small congregation of the church plant, there's about 100 people, and I began to tell them that nothing is going to happen. You're going to wake up on January 1st, 2000, and nothing will have happened, and you would have wasted hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on all this prep material. And there was a sweet lady in the back, and she actually had been a bookkeeper in our church. She was about 35 years old, and she stood up, and she yelled at me from the back of the sanctuary. And she said, Pastor, how do you know? How can you stand up there and tell us that you know for certain that nothing is going to happen on January 1st, 2000? And I told her the same thing I told you guys. I said, uh, uh, I forget her name. That, that was, you know, 20 some year, 20 years ago, 21 years ago. And I told her, I said, you know what? I, I, I got, first of all, God has spoken to me, but I also know that there's not going to be an end of the world before the end of the world. The, the movies would have you to believe that there's going to be multiple ends of the world. There's only going to be one end of the world where everything happens all at once. It's not like there's going to be a meteor that destroys the earth and then like 100 years later we recover from that. And then there's a plague that wipes out the entire universe and the apes take over and then we're going to recover from that. You understand what I'm saying? Or there's going to be an ice age because of global warming and then 100 years later we're going to recover from that. There's not going to be multiple ends of the world. There's going to be one end of the world. And it's all going to happen at the same time. And I said, plus, the thing that I know is that God is the one who will be the instrument of the end of the world and not man destroying himself. You need to understand that when you read the Bible. The end of the world is not man destroying himself. Even the, the battle of Armageddon is not man destroying himself. The end of the world is about what God does. God is the one who brings the wrath. Now, she sat down and she was very upset with me but of course we all know in hindsight that january 1st 2000 how do you remember that day how many were, were you were staying up late how many stayed up to midnight and you were watching the news cassie how old were you back then you were watching that <laughs> you're 10 years old wow and so we were all interested in what was going to happen and of course you know there were a few elevators that didn't work right but everything else went on as usual and folks, I just want you to know, the world, the news, I hate to say this, but it doesn't even matter what side you're on politically. You need to know it is the job of the news networks, listen to this, to get ratings. And they got to find creative ways for you to watch their, their news and their shows. And it's, it's drama. It's just it's soap opera, politics, and all kinds of stuff. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't. Uh, I'm not anti-doctors and anti-medicine. I'm really not. I go to the doctor. I, I do take meds. I have things that, that are wrong with me, and I have to counter that, such as cholesterol. I take cholesterol medicine, you know, things like this. And so I believe in all that stuff. I go to my doctor. But there's also a fear factor that we have to avoid. Can you say amen to that? And so I want you to know there's a big difference between being confident in God's will in your life and people's opinions and you will fight this your whole life the confidence to know that this is what god has for me now i remember my wife and i uh not everybody was excited about my wife and i getting married most of our friends were but there were a few family members and others who told us that we shouldn't get married and they said that it's just not going to work they had their reasons and they were pretty forceful about it, and they were nervous. Our wedding day came, and, and they're sitting over to the side, and they're nervous that something bad is going to happen. There's a lot of people who are going to have opinions about how you should live your life. But we have the greatest source on earth, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who can give us a confidence in his will, in which you can wake up every day knowing what God has for me. Can I get an Amen. I want to read this story to you from Nehemiah chapter 6. Well, first of, all, first of all, I want to share some thoughts with you before we get into Scripture. And that is this. First of all, you, this is just three thoughts. You need to have confidence in God's will. You need to have confidence in God's will. This takes prayer. This takes knowing God's word. One of the reasons why I'm so confident in what's going to happen in the end times is because I know what God's word says about the end times. It is clear about how it is going to progress. And there are many people out there, and I hate to say them, they're charlatans, and they will write books 
about current events, and they will try to take current events, and they will try to take the Bible and, and, and impose scripture on current events to get you to buy their book to predict that they know when the world is going to happen, only for it not to happen. How many know what I'm saying is true? You have to be the one that's in prayer at the altar, having a confidence that this is what we should do. Folks, when, when you have an opportunity to give, and most of us are on a fixed income, and the Lord speaks to your heart and says, give $200, and you don't have $200. The Lord says to you, I want you to give $500, and you don't have $500 to give. My wife and I were missionaries to Spain, and the Lord prompted me to give $1,000. That's what we had in our savings account. To a homeless ministry that was in San Francisco at the time, April and Evan Prosser, they were fully appointed uh, Assembly of God missionaries to the homeless in San Francisco, and they're still doing an amazing job. And we emptied our savings account, and we gave that to them, and the Lord gave me a promise that because I gave that money, we would eventually be able to buy a house. And sure enough, uh, shortly after uh, we ended our missionary tenure, we came home to the States, and we were trying to buy a house, and of course, our credit score wasn't good enough, and all these different finance, how many know it's hard to buy a house, everything's got to be in order, and we didn't quite have everything in order. And we had someone write a check for us for $235,000, to buy a house in Modesto, and we made payments to them. How many know that God can do above and beyond what you think or imagine? He can. God can provide in miraculous ways beyond what you think is possible. You have to be confident in God's will. You gotta know what he says to you. First of all, you gotta be confident in God's satisfaction. Listen to this, you gotta know that your faith is pleasing him. I'm not talking about your attendance record. I'm not talking about your giving record. I'm talking about your heart. That's why we're doing this series called Change of Heart. There are a lot of people who do mechanically religious things, and they think God is pleased by that. In the Old Testament, he says, I detest your sacrifices. Remember, they would bring animal sacrifices, and they would kill the animal. This is before Jesus died on the cross, and they would place their hands on that animal, and they would say, there is a transference of sin, and God accepts this sacrifice as an atonement for my sin, this shed being blood. Uh, this blood being shed. <laughs> hey, I got a perfect excuse this morning, right? Daylight savings. How many are tired? Wave at me if you're tired. All right. The blood was shed, and that represented life for life. Life for life. But God was telling the Israelites, I don't want your sacrifices anymore. He goes, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He goes, I want you to be compassionate with one another. I want you to love one another. I want you to show the signs of that forgiveness. I want you to show the signs that you've been forgiven and that you've been set free. He's saying this to the Old Testament saints. How much more so to the New Testament saints now that we have Jesus Christ as our ultimate sacrifice for sin. Can you say amen? You've got to know that what you're doing is pleasing God. That when you are generous, you know that it's pleasing him. When you uh, take steps of faith and you give when you don't have the money to give. When you step out and you talk to somebody in the grocery store and you don't know their situation, you're just responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You come down to the altar and you kneel before the Lord because you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do that. You've got to have confidence in that satisfaction. I am pleasing God by my faith, not my religious actions, by my faith. I know that I have faith in God. How many have ever taken the time? I did this one time. I was going through a real crisis in my life, and I, I, I've shared this numerous times. I went to the, to the ocean, I was by the beach, and I was in my car, and I just began to declare the basics of my faith. I believe there's a God. How many have ever had to go back to the basics of their faith? I believe there's a God, and I believe his word is true, and I believe that he sent his son to die on the cross for my sins, and I began to declare the fundamentals of our faith. You need to ask yourself what you believe today, because it's in that confidence you'll be able to walk in his will. Number three, you've got to have confidence in God's advice. When God speaks to you, when he gives you wisdom, you've got to act upon it. James chapter 1 says, if you receive wisdom... Don't be double-minded. That's what James chapter 1 tells us. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, a reed that is blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord, the Bible says. So when you go to the Lord, don't, 
present petitions and requests to him. In doubt, you've got to have faith to believe that he hears you and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Can you say amen? When he speaks to you and he's, he gives you that advice, when, like I said, April and I, we got together, we knew that we were the ones for each other. We felt like God had spoken to us that we were supposed to get married. And when you have that confidence, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. If God's calling you to some type of ministry or missions work and everyone's saying, hey, don't do that. You're going to be poor. You're going to miss out on life. You're going to be giving yourself away and for what? You're going to get all kinds of opinions about how you should live your life. Don't take that job, people are going to say. Don't uh, participate like that. Don't give 10% of your income. Don't volunteer so much. Everybody has an opinion. You've got to know that God has spoken to you. You are supposed to serve in the girls' ministry, and you know that. You are supposed to give to the fire Bible, and you know that. You are supposed to be together with this person, and you know that. You have confidence in God's advice. All right, let's get to the scripture. Nehemiah chapter 6. Sandballot, what a name. What kind of mother names her son Sandballot? <clears throat> Sandballot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. This is Nehemiah. He had been in exile. He was a Jew, but he was in exile. He was serving a king. He had asked the king, can I go and repair the walls around my city of my people? He got the blessing of the king. He's doing that. He rallied everybody together, and now they're finishing the job. But look what happens in verse 2. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking them to meet at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Oh, no! <clears throat> but I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them, I am engaged in a great work, I cannot come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave them the same reply. The fifth time, Sanballat's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. And that is why you are rebuilding the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. They also report that you've appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you, to prophesy about you and say, look, there is a king in Judah, as if though they're speaking for God and declaring this. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king, so I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. Verse 8. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. I love this next phrase. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Folks, Nehemiah is someone who is confident in God's will. He was confident in God's satisfaction. He knew in faith he was doing what God had called him to do. He knew he was pleasing God by his actions. He also knew he was confident in God's advice, that nothing could detour him away from the job. That's the kind of confidence I'm trying to inspire you with. So no matter what they say on the news, no matter what all your friends are saying, no matter what the opinions of the world may say, you have faith in what God has spoken to you. I have a quote here, and it says, there's no greater satisfaction than the confidence that you are perfectly positioned in God's will. Those waiting for their purpose to manifest itself quite often want to either distract, discourage, or destroy those who already have their purpose. They have God's will in their life. What happens here? Sometimes we become entertained by other people's purpose. For example, matchmaking. I remember my mom and dad set me up when I was young with a couple of young ladies, and they were disastrous. April wasn't one of them. They were disastrous. Now, 
There are times when I was raising my four kids, I have to admit, the idea of them picking their own spouse has made me pretty nervous, and there were moments in which I believed in the principle of arranged marriage. Any parents feel that way a little bit when you're raising your kids? You think, maybe I should arrange a marriage for them. Blind dates. We are entertained by helping people. Helping people find the right job. Helping people to decide what they should do with their life. Our kids or others say, I want to be an astronaut someday. I want to be a policeman someday. We have a tendency to want to steer them into the family business or steer them towards something that makes us feel safe, that makes us feel comfortable, something that will bring that provision. We try to steer them in a responsible direction. And we, we don't teach them how to hear God's voice. We teach them to hear our voice. We teach them to hear voices of authority. And I believe that authority matters and that voices of authority matter. And I'm not saying parents shouldn't give advice, nor should kids uh, stop listening to their parents' advice. But what happens when God's word supersedes those authorities? And it does happen sometimes. You have to know. You have to be confident in your will. Even though we had a few people telling us, we don't think you guys should get married. We had to go back to our prayer closet. We had to have conversation in which we say, we need to make absolutely sure that this is God's will. I was living in Texas at the time. I had taken a, a new position in Texas. So for three months before we were married, <clears throat> we were, uh, she was back in California with her parents preparing for the wedding, and I was the youth pastor at this church in uh, White House, Texas. Anybody know where that's at near Tyler? And I was preparing our future and getting a place to live and all these types of things, and it made me nervous to hear that she was she had people telling her, I don't think you should get married. I was nervous that she was going to listen to that. But there came a point, I remember, in which I surrendered to God's will. And I said, you know what, Lord? I don't want to marry somebody who's going to be wishy-washy. I want a woman who's going to hear from God and know the voice of God on her own. I'm just going to trust you. We called each other. This is back in the days when you actually had to pay for long distance. Remember those days? And we spent an average, in those three months, we spent an average of $400 in, in long distance calls. How many know that's a lot of money? Just talking, talking everything out. We would pray on the phone. There were so many different things. And finally, when it came time, and it was two weeks, and we even, even up to two weeks beforehand, the day beforehand, some of these people were still saying these things. We continued to say to one another, I know what God has spoken to my heart. My parents, uh, my mom in particular, didn't want me to go into ministry. She wanted me to do something safe, like become a psychologist or be a lawyer or something that had some kind of stable income. And I had to tell her, Mom, I know that I'm supposed to go to Bible college and go into the ministry. When we went to Angel's Camp, my wife cried. We were in the taqueria, and everybody thought that I was a horribly abusive husband because how much she was crying in this little taqueria that we were at. And we had ordered our food, and she was crying and crying. She didn't want to go to Angel's Camp. She didn't want to play in a church. She didn't want to go to the mountains. How many know who my wife is? She didn't want to live in the mountains. She doesn't like outdoors. She didn't want to go there. And I said, babe, I know that I know that God has called me. There's a big difference between opinions and purpose. And some people think that their purpose is to share their opinion. Can I get an amen on that one? I have another quote. The devil has no eternal purpose anymore. His judgment has already been cast. Out of jealousy and rage, he is relegated to only one remaining option, which is to destroy God's creation and hurt his people. You see, when people lose their purpose, they can actually become destructive to other people out of jealousy out of a desire to micromanage, out of a desire to control. And you've got to be careful of other people who have no purpose or their purpose is corrupt. If you've got friends in the world, and I'm not saying you can't have friends in the world, but you have to be careful because their mindset is not the kind that is governed and controlled by the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I want advice that comes from 
friends who are believers that I know is flowing in the Holy Spirit. When my friends talk to me, when my family members talk to me, I want to hear the Holy Spirit in their mouths. Can you say amen to that? I want to show you three things about mastering the art of self-leadership. You may be asking, why are you using that term self-leadership? Because there comes a point in which you have to make choices. You don't just say, God, I surrender to you and expect that at that point God does everything. He will go before you. He has provided victory. He has given you his word. He has provided the comfort and the power of the Holy Spirit. But you still have to make choices. I've seen amazing people of God still make bad choices in regards to their health, in regards to their finances. We all make mistakes. And you might be filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. You may know the God's word backwards and forwards. But we still have to deal with our own choices. And we have to lead ourselves into good choices. And the first way we need to do that is we lead ourselves into clarity. Lead yourself into clarity. You've got to find out the truth. You've got to know what God's word says. The enemy is going to produce all kinds of emotions to confuse your available options. I've had people call me up. I've, oh, I don't know. I've got, uh, I've got three or four uh, young ladies that I'm considering, but I just don't know uh, which one I should get together with. I just don't know which one is God's will for me to marry. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, if you're a single person to have three or four choices in that regard? And they call me up, and they're just filled with all this emotion trying to figure it out. And I tell them, you know what's the best thing that you can do? And they'll say, what, Pastor? Tell me. You tell me. I have people say this to me all the time. Pastor, you tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. And I say, okay, don't date any of them. Well, Pastor, I, I'm not sure about that advice. <laughs> I thought you said anything I said you were going to do. We have a tendency to seek out people who agree with us. Isn't that right? We get emotionally twisted around, and we want to make a decision about a car. It's the car. We, we've made the decision in our heart that this is the car that we want, and we'll find people to agree with us and say things like, hey, you should get what you want. You know. I've said this in a previous sermon. There's a lot of good people out there with bad advice. You have to lead yourself into clarity. You have to know what is best and what is a wise choice. And you also have to allow the clarity to come from the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've done this before, but you need to go into your prayer time with an open mind that God might disagree with you. He might say no. I know it's hard to imagine God doing that, but God might tell you no. Or he might say, that's not what I have for you. I remember God saying a phrase like that very distinctly to me. We were planning a church in Georgetown, Texas. And I was working with this guy, and he had a rock wall. And we would put it, it was on a trailer. And we would take it to events. And hydraulics, it would go up in the air. And then it had all the ropes and everything. And, and, the, and they, kids would climb this wall. And, and I would do that for like $500 a weekend. I would do this rock wall for him to make extra money. And I remember I was sitting in his office, and we were planting a church in Georgetown, Texas, near Austin. And I'm sitting in his office, and as clear as a bell, God spoke to me and said, this is not what I have for you. And you know the crazy thing about it is, I didn't have an alternate thought about what God did have for me. How many know that's frustrating? There's nothing more frustrating when God says, this is not the right direction, but he doesn't necessarily in that same moment say what the right direction is. You just simply have to stop. And you got to start praying. you got to slow things down. you got to say, God, what do you have for me? Remember, I've said it before, multiple confirmations over a period of time from multiple sources. That's how you know God's will. Even if you know for certain he spoke to you at an altar and you get a word from him, I knew that God had said to me, this is not what I have for you. But I had to pray and I had to have the confirmations. And eventually God opened another door that was amazing that paid far more and provided far more than what I was doing with that job. It was an incredible opportunity. But I wouldn't have been able 
to know that. I, ha I have a quote that I use all the time. When you're going through a difficulty in your life and God's slowing things down, or it seems like all the doors are closed, sometimes God is positioning us to say yes to something we wouldn't normally say yes to. You need to write that down. That's a word. Literally, I, I believe prophetically, that is a word for a few people in this room right now. God is positioning you to say yes to something you wouldn't normally say yes to. When everything's going good, you don't feel like you need to hear from God. When you, you feel like your plan is working out, you're making good money, everything is prospering. There's nothing within us that wants to pause and to stop and to reconsider what's going on in our life because everything is going great. So sometimes he allows things in our life to shut down to, to get our attention. How many know God gets our attention sometimes? Has God ever gotten your attention? Come on, be honest. Has he ever gotten your attention? He's trying to put a thought in your head. He's trying to give you an idea you wouldn't have considered before unless he gets your attention. Number two, he's leading you into cause. This is huge. He's leading you into cause. I need you to write this phrase down right now, what I'm about to say. You can't care about everything. You can't. You can't be involved in every great cause that's out there. You don't have the time. You can't have a passion for every type of dysfunctional type uh, area in our world to try and right those wrongs. You can't care about everything. You'll exhaust yourself doing that. You have to choose the cause. And hopefully you're hearing the Lord say, this is the cause that I have for you. It doesn't mean you don't care about the other causes. You simply just don't have the time to give to those causes and you're trusting God to take care of them. Listen, even Jesus followed this principle. He said, I, have, I am called to the Jews. And there were some Greeks who wanted to talk to him who were outside and they were at the front door and his disciples said, there are some Greeks who are here that want to talk to you. And Jesus said, unless a seed, so, okay, let's back up. There's some people at the door. Just imagine. How many think Jesus was a little bit confusing when he would give advice? Anybody? He, took it, he talked in parables and riddles, right? Now listen to his response. Just imagine there's someone at your front door and I'm at your house. And you say, Pastor, there's some people at the front door who want to talk to you, and I give you this answer. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot produce fruit. You'd be standing there going, is that a yes or a no? But what was he saying? He was saying, that I am called to the Jews, and I am that seed that is going to die and be buried and be resurrected. But the fruit that is going to come from be, being focused on my mission and accomplishing the salvation of the world is going to produce fruit in many others who are going to sprout up because of my sacrifice. And eventually, the Greeks will be ministered to when those other seeds are also planted and they flourish because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? He said, but I have to fulfill my mission and I have got to be that seed that goes into the ground and dies and is sacrificed so that there can be much fruit from it. He was focused on his mission. He couldn't, he didn't, he didn't have the logistical ability. Now we know that he's in heaven and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can minister in many, many different ways, but he, he was on earth, he was fully human, he was fully God. He, he just, in a logistical way, he could not be everything to everybody and go throughout the world. He had to delegate. And if Jesus couldn't do that in his humanity, even though he was sinless, he had the incredible power of the Holy Spirit, he was fully human and fully God, how much more so do you need to relegate your time and effort? Can I get an amen? You have to be wise about your time. Number three, 
you got to lead yourself into closure. This is huge. I love the word closure. Is there anybody out there, like, you don't get to finish a conversation and you need closure, you call the person back because you need closure? Celeste was the only one to raise her hand. Anybody else besides me and Celeste? How many of you like closure? You like to finish things? Nobody. Okay, there's a few. All right, finally. I pray that the spirit of raising hands would take over this church. <laughs> it's like an amen. An amen. It just, it's encouraging to the pastor who's preaching to see response. The enemy loves to keep you in limbo so you never feel the joy of accomplishment. You start things and you don't finish. You get discouraged. You start a ministry, you don't finish it. You start giving towards your pledge and you don't finish it. The enemy is constantly trying to get you to quit what you're doing. You get busy, you get stressed. And it's always amazing to me how people won't give up the big game on Sunday. People won't give up going out on Friday night with their friends. One of the first things that they get rid of when they're trying to simplify their life and they're stressed out is they stop going to church. They literally cut off the source, the one true source that's going to bring refreshment into their life. Leading yourself into closure. Finishing. Continuing on. Sometimes you might start and stop, but then start again. Finish well. You may say to yourself, you know, I, I came across some obstacles. I, I went through a difficult time. How many know we all deal with that in our marriage? It doesn't mean that you quit. It means that you reevaluate. It means you get some counseling. But the important thing is to finish well. You don't just quit your job just because there's a few difficulties. You find a way to work it out. There are many ways in which you've developed this discipline. I am asking you to transfer that skill that you've developed for your marriage or your work or your hobbies. I'm asking you to transfer that to the kingdom of God and to finish things in the kingdom. You already have the skill in your tool belt. You already know how to move forward when it's absolutely necessary. Transfer that skill and learn how to bring closure to the ministries that you're responsible for to finish that mentoring, finish that counseling, to finish getting rid of that addiction, to finish that book, to finish that series, to finish that pledge, finish well. Folks, I think God is gonna really reward people who towards the latter end of their lives, they didn't just check out, you know, I, I believe in retirement, I'm planning for that. How many are planning for retirement? But we can't retire from the kingdom you can't retire from the kingdom. You are obligated to minister up until the day you die. You have a purpose until you die, spiritually. And you may not be able to do some of the things you did as a young person. You may not have the energy. But there are so many things that you can do to benefit the kingdom. Don't ever give up. Finish well in the kingdom. Don't just make statements like, well, I've paid my dues. What dues? I don't read about any dues in the Bible. I know we got to pay our tithes, but those aren't dues. Oh, I've, 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 I've given up my time. I've already done these things. I don't need to do anymore. No, no, no. There's no retirement in the kingdom. If you want to stop working a full-time job, fine. You want to kick your kids out of your house because they're 30 years old and still don't have a job, fine. I agree with that. If you want to get rid of that old car, that classic car that you've been working on and you've never finished and it's stressing you out and you want to sell it, fine. If you want to sell your stamp collection or your coin collection, fine. If you want to turn off sports and stop watching every single game, fine. If you want to stop doing all those things with those bad friends who go out and drink and things of that nature, fine. But don't give up the one who can breathe life into your soul, who can refresh your mind through God's word. And particularly the people of God who can gather around you, and hopefully we pray for this, are allowing the Holy Spirit to bring refreshing godly advice. Not opinions of this world, but godly advice. How many want to have a confidence that they are exactly where God wants me to be? Just like Nehemiah, no matter what anybody 
is trying to do. No matter how they're trying to intimidate him. They're sending letters. They're manipulative. They're trying to sabotage him. Folks, the world, the enemy is going to try and sabotage your future. You can't give up. you got to have hope. you got to believe. you got to always believe that God has a promise. God has a miracle. You might be going through a season of difficulty, but I can tell you right now, it is not God's will for your entire life to be a season of difficulty. It's a season. It's going to have a beginning and an end. You need to bring closure to that season and embrace the promised land miracle that he has for you coming up. But you also need to know that when you're walking in blessings, that there might be times of difficulty. But you're ready. You're confident in who God is. You're confident in what God says. You're confident in the Holy Spirit who's dwelling in you. You're going to him and you feel a peace in your heart that even though it looks, it seems like everything is bad, I know that in Jesus, everything is good. How many know you got two sets of eyes? You got natural eyes and you got spiritual eyes. I don't know about you, but I want to stop looking with my natural eyes at my circumstances and being afraid all the time. And I'm not saying I'm afraid. I'm speaking like, pe like people do. People who are in the world, they've got their natural eyes and they're afraid of what they see. They're afraid with their natural ears of what they hear. Folks, I want supernatural eyes that can see what's happening in the spiritual realm. That supersedes what's happening in the natural. I can hear God's word that supersedes what I'm hearing from all the pundits and the newscasters and everybody who's trying to spread fear. Now, folks, I'm not saying you shouldn't be cautious and you shouldn't be careful, but if you are dominated by fear, I can tell you right now with complete certainty, it is not God's will for you to walk in fear. we got to bind the spirit of fear and walk in confidence. Bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you this morning to speak life. I'm going to ask our altar team, even now, Brother Fito, those of you who have the lanyards, our leadership team.